most yeah. of the studies that are out there are a few months long, which in humans is a pretty yeah. small fraction of lifespan, where in the mice yeah. we're often doing more, more actual time, which is a much bigger fraction of their lifespan. What is the higher dose that the, a human can use of those uh, NMN or NO? So the doses that are being sold and marketed for, you know, for human use are 250 to 350 milligrams per day. Okay. Um, the human clinical trials have gone as high as two grams a day. And I think the way they got to that limit of what's really been tested is based on the fact that nicotinamide or nicotinic acid, the conventional vitamin B3 will be isoforms, um, and start to show hepatotoxicity around. I mean, it's, it can occur starting at about one gram a day, and then it becomes common over three grams a day for both of them. Uh, and so I think that's been the fear in people's minds. If you can go on a molar basis, uh, those have a smaller molecular mass. And so the, the weight, the equivalent for nicotinamide riboside would be somewhere around you know, three or four grams a day, if you're trying to match that one gram a day dose that has risk for the other B3 isoforms. And so that's my impression, at least, is people have been afraid to get near that threshold. So, so, so what, you, what I'm hearing from you, that the dose that today the supplements are sold is not toxic. Most likely it won't be toxic. So it might be not beneficial, but most likely it won't be toxic for the user. Right. So I think the, you know, there's always a, an issue with, you know, they, they have to be careful with your language around safety, I think, right? Yeah. Whenever we're doing something new, um, you know, nobody knows what the, the effects of 20 years of taking one of these supplements is, is, is going to be. I think as supplements go and as having this kind of intervention in your life goes, this is a pretty safe choice. The safety data look really good for the short-term studies that have been done for safety perspectives. So for several months, even at a pretty high dose, much higher than you would normally buy over the counter for these supplements, uh, there's been no indication that there's any toxicity. So I think it's got a big leg up on many of the other things you would find on the shelf at GNC in terms of yeah. the, the expectation of safety. Um, but, you know, there's, again, the, the, nobody can guarantee it when you're taking something that no, there's never been a study for 10 years with 10,000 people. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And even with the FDA approved drugs, after five or 10 years, suddenly you, you find some uh, side effects. So everyone need to especially with supplement and need to make the pros and cons for any supplement that is taking. Yeah, it might not be toxic for months, but it might be toxic after five or 10 years. And all of us, everyone that's listening to this podcast would like to live better longer. So be careful about that for sure. And uh, you mentioned about human uh, studies so far that uh, uh, at least few of them show that uh, when you consume those analog, you see an increase in the blood. My uh, follow-up question is, what are the benefits of uh, consuming those analog, at least uh, from the studies that uh, you have seen? So, the, I mean, the anecdotal benefits are, are all over the place. Uh, people claim uh, to, to you know, have higher energy to sleep better. Um, no, no, I'm talking, I'm talking but, uh, about, uh, you know, peer-reviewed pre scientific yeah, yeah. Uh, benefits. I'm not talking <laughs> about one person said that uh, his nails grew to five right. meters. <laughs> that one does come up, the nail growing, <laughs> which yeah. I eventually uh, I noticed that myself. Um, no, I, I think the you know the things that are pretty solid at this point um, are, are really um, the body composition improving. So there's been a couple of studies that, and the effect on body composition has been proportional to how long and how high a dose um, in, in these studies. Um, so I, I do think that there's uh, an, you know an increase in lean mass and decrease in fat mass, not an overall decrease in body weight. Uh, in, in almost any of the studies. There's a pretty dramatic improvement with nicotinic acid in, in mitochondrial myopathy, so functionally. So this is sort of a rare disease um, that, that causes muscle wasting, and those people have shown functional improvements after taking nicotinic acid, and you can actually um, correlate the degree of improvement with how low their blood NAD levels were and how low muscle biopsy NAD levels were. So that, that's pretty encouraging um, in that case. And, and so it's a pretty strong evidence that if you find the right condition, it will be beneficial. Um, and then I think after that, you get into to a lot of shakier things. So there's, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, ataxia, telangiectasia. There's been a study showing that based on sort of scores of functional characteristics, the patients are doing better, but it's not sort of placebo controlled. And there's not a lot known about how the natural history of that disease goes. So it's hard to put it in context right now of how 
confident and excited we should be. Uh, there's similar kinds of things for ALS, particularly with um, Elysium's formulation, which includes pterostilbene. So we don't know if that's the NAD boosting or not. But uh, a small groups of patients, again, show pretty impressive improvements in, in functional scores uh, in those types of things. Um, there's been one study with nicotinamide mononucleotide arguing that it improves muscle insulin sensitivity in humans. Um, and that's sort of counterbalanced by several studies with nicotinamide riboside showing no effect on insulin sensitivity. Uh, and, and so the, I think the one on NMN that had the positive result was a little bit um, hard to interpret in the sense that the placebo group um, had, had no real improvement, but the group that got NMN started with a little bit of insulin resistance and kind of improved up to the level of placebo group. Uh, you yeah. know, so there was an improvement within that group, but it wasn't that different from the placebo treated people at the end. Um, and, and so that, that study is being redone with a larger number and, and we'll see how well that holds up if there really is a muscle insulin sensitivity phenotype that's consistent. Um, but as I said, many of the other studies that have done riboside at least uh, haven't seen improvements in insulin sensitivity. And, and so this is, kind of been the story of, the, of these human clinical trials so far is that there, there have been um, scattered promising indications with a lot of negative data and many of them. Yeah, I in last year ARDD, I heard a group in a, a, a European group in Denmark that actually look at m muscle biopsy in human and they try to see obviously treated with uh, one of the analog, I don't remember which one, and they haven't seen any effect on the muscle uh, structure or muscle power, but they also seen a negative effect on the, I think that it was an LDL cholesterol that uh, become higher. I don't know if this paper was published yet or not. Have you heard about this study? I don't think I have heard of that one specifically. Okay. Um, okay. In a few cases with yeah, things like, um, um, you know, homocysteine or LDL cholesterol have moved a little bit. I think in the Elysium study that did too, but they, you know, it was unclear again because they have pterostilbene in their compound as mm -hmm. well. Clear which component um, is responsible for that. But um, at least in the data, I've seen a, a lot of these things have not been super clear and consistent between studies, even if there was a statistically significant bump in one. Yeah. And, and, and I, I worry that a lot of it comes down to multiple comparisons as well, where, you know, there's, 50 parameters being measured and one of them hits a P of 0.05. So <laughs> it ends up you know, being flagged in that study. But uh, I, I'm not aware of too many things like that that have been repeated multiple times independently. So, so in your opinion, why is the data is so weak in human for the analogs and so strong in the mice? What is the reason for that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a critical question for the field right now. I mean, so one possibility is the dose, right? There is this issue of, you know, concern about potential toxicity that keeps people limiting the dose that they, they treat humans with, where in mice, we're doing 500 milligrams per kilogram in a lot of these studies, right? Which would mm -hmm. be 40 grams in a human, way above what anyone's ever done. Um, and in the mice, if you dial back the dose, uh, it doesn't work as well generally. <laughs> and so that's one possibility is that we really need to scale by body weight um, to see the same effects. Um, I think, you know, some of the other potential things are, you know, related to species differences with, um, you know, sort of immune regulation or microbiome uh, modification of some of these things. Maybe that we don't, you know, have the same species in our guts that the mice do. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it, it's something we, we've really got to deal with now. And I think the other thing that it illustrates is that we don't have great markers for a lot of what we're trying to look at. <laughs> you know, we don't know which tissue we're trying to increase the NAD in or which cell type and what that does to that tissue or cell type and then how that mediates the beneficial effect that we see in the mice. Uh, and so it leaves us stuck in many cases, with the human studies, just, just not knowing if we're triggering some similar pathway or failing to activate the pathway. So, so it sounds to me that uh, we are still in the early days in the human studies and uh, we really don't have the right hypothesis what is the effect of those on a, a specific organ or specific processes. And we are basically in a fishing expedition and it's very hard to do a fishing expedition in humans because the hand should be big and it's very expensive and it's very hard for, I assume, supplement company to do it because it's uh, super expensive. That's fair to say. Yeah, no, I think I think all of that is true, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, I mean, it may just be the length of studies in many cases too, right? So most yeah. of the studies that are out there are a few months long, which in humans is a pretty yeah. small fraction of lifespan. 
where the mice yeah. were often doing more more actual time, which is a much bigger fraction of their lifespan to see some of these things. And so that, that may be part of it too, that we just need to sustain this intervention over a much longer time to see certain benefits. Yeah. And if one of our listeners will come to you and say, hey, Joe, should I consume any man or an hour? What, uh, what will be your reaction? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it comes down a little bit to personality too, right? Like, I mean, if, you know, if you're comfortable with a little bit of risk for some potential gain, you know, to, to, to roll the dice a little bit with these things, I do think it's one of the particularly safe supplements that's out there. And, and if you feel better on it, um, you know, I, I would certainly feel comfortable saying you, you should go ahead and stay on it, you know, if, if it's making you feel better. Um, yeah, I think that's, you okay. know, I think one of the things we have to recognize, I guess, is, you know, I always, I always point out that it's, it's easy for us to say, there's insufficient evidence, you know, for this or that, and these things haven't been evaluated in sufficient, you know, phase three trials. At the same time, there's probably 50,000 dietary supplements that are being marketed right now. And I think we also have to deal with the fact in life that they will never all be tested. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not possible. Yeah. And, and so to some degree, we, we do have to decide what we're, how much risk we're comfortable taking and then uh, you take our best guess at some of these things. And I think for sure, if you actually feel the benefit, and I've had a lot of people tell me that, that they you know, anecdotally sleep better or feel more energetic, uh, I certainly would encourage them to stick with it if that's what makes them feel better. And are you personally consuming them? And if yes, which one? <laughs> so uh, I mean, I've taken both. Uh, I'm more I haven't committed to a regimen, you know, indefinitely for, for either one. What I do is sort of uh, experiment on myself with them sometimes. You know, we've got a Peloton bike and I definitely, uh, you know, try to ride it a couple of times and get all my metrics and then supplement for a couple of weeks and see if they change and that kind of thing. Um, so I've more commonly taken nicotine might wrap aside just because it's more readily available. <laughs> and do you see any benefits or you feel any benefits? I've got to say, I haven't been able to quantify anything that I'd be willing to claim, <laughs> you know, in, in terms yeah. of the actual output metrics for, you know, workout or something. Uh, for me, it hasn't changed much off or on. Um, I've definitely felt more energetic when I'm trying to fall asleep. So sort of in contrast to what people constantly tell me about how much better they sleep, I find I sleep worse <laughs> when I take okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it might it might be a, a person-specific or and maybe it's uh, just a placebo effect, right? Yeah. It's out of normal. Yeah. And you mentioned the, so, the fingernail thing, which comes up a lot, actually, which, I, which yeah. I have noticed a few times. When I take it, I suddenly have to cut my nails a lot more. Yeah, so you feel you see that as well. Yeah, I heard it from a, a few people that I spoke with them about that. That's a, I think that that's the most frequent, I don't know if benefit, but effect of those supplements is a, a, somehow the a fingernails are, a, I know, growing faster. For sure, that's a, I'm hearing a lot about that. 